Monish Pabrai, Lee Lu, Guy Spear, Seth Klarman, David Tepper, and Sequoia. What is it that all of these investors have in common? Each of these wildly successful investors at some point over the past two years invested in Micron and still hold it today. Even Charlie gave Monish and Lee Lu the old manga tick of approval after hearing they collaborated on the investment idea back in 2019. You and uh, Lee Lu collaborated on uh, Micron. He said... Um, it will do very well. But Micron is a semiconductor company operating in an industry that you could label highly competitive, capital intensive, complex, cyclical. It's certainly not an area that I look at and think that's a place where I feel comfortable investing. So why on earth do so many long-term investors have large positions in Micron? Well, today I'm gonna to be answering that question by going straight to the source, the investors themselves. This video today isn't going to be my analysis. Uh, I have spent about 20 hours over the past week looking into Micron and learning all all about DRAM and transistors and Moore's law, but I still find it all very complex. Fortunately for us, there are a ton of write-ups and interviews from big investors who have invested in Micron and have positions in Micron. So there's a ton of information out there about what the general thesis is for Micron. And that's what we're going to cover in today's video. But first, I'm going to need you to go below this video and hit that subscribe button. It's free. You'll be helping me reach 100,000 subscribers, which we're very, very close to achieving. And you can unsubscribe at any time. So please, help me. <laughs> so who is it exactly that's invested in Micron? Well, we can get a lot of this data from a website called Dataroma. Uh, they include a number of very highly respected investors and their US portfolios. So we can take a look and see who holds Micron at the moment. At the top of the list is Monish Prabhai. He has 1.8 million shares worth $142 million. And funnily enough, it's actually the only US investment that he currently has. He has a number of other investments outside of the US, which uh, make up the majority of his investment portfolio through his fund. Uh, however, in the US, uh, now he just has Micron stock and he actually first invested into Micron back in 2018. Monish then shared his thesis with Lee Lu, his friend, and together they collaborated on the analysis and research and it led to Lee Lu also adding a position in 2019. Again, Micron is his biggest US position. It's 37% of all the American companies that he has in the portfolio. And currently he has 11.4 million shares of Micron uh, worth $894 million. David Tepper, a billionaire hedge fund manager with $2.5 billion of assets under management. He started buying in 2016 when the stock was in the teens. Although he's been much more active in terms of his trading of Micron going in and out of it over the last few years. But as of today, it is currently his fifth largest position representing 6.6% of the portfolio. We then have Guy Spear, another incredible investor and friend of Monish. He has 6.5% of his portfolio in Micron, which was initiated in 2019. Seth Klarman, who has one of the best investing track records going back multiple decades. He has a small position in Micron, just 2.7% of the portfolio, which he initiated in late 2020 when the stock was about $35 to $45 per share. Sequoia Fund, which is a value fund founded by Warren Buffett's partner back when he ran the Buffett partnership. They have 5% of their portfolio in Micron. And besides Sequoia, all of these investors seem to have bought the stock around the same price, around $30 to $45 per per share is where most of the adding is happening from these investors. So that made me very, very curious about looking into the business and seeing is this a business that I can understand and that maybe I can do my own independent analysis, reach a conclusion and, and potentially invest in the business. And at first glance, this stock looks absolutely terrible. It looks awful. In fact, it's so bad that I began wondering whether the investors that I've looked up to all of this time, whether they've been suffering from some kind of groupthink cognitive bias. This is one of the most historically hated stocks in the world. I historically hate this stock. Which on a side note tangent is something you should be very, very careful of because all value investors love to farm ideas from other value investors. And I think that is great to see what other like-minded people are doing and how they're thinking. Uh, but even value investors who kind of pride themselves on going against the consensus uh, can fall into the trap of or fall into the comfort of going along with what everyone else is doing, which is what the rest of the asset management industry looks like. Everyone just doing the exact same thing, because then if one person is wrong, it doesn't look as bad as if you're wrong while everybody else is right. But Micron essentially is a memory chip designer and manufacturer. They generate revenue mainly from two types of memory, DRAM, which acts as temporary volatile memory 
for PCs and other computer devices, and NAND memory, which is non-volatile, meaning it can store data without the need for power and is used in things such as solar state drives and other types of data storage products. And as Monish himself described, this industry has been a dog-eat-dog -dog industry. It has been terrible and it's really a combination of two factors that have made that the case. One is capital intensity and the other is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is an observation made by one of the co-founders of Intel in 1965 which showed that the number of transistors that could be placed on a microchip would likely double every two years while the cost would halve every two years. This of course means that designers or innovators in the space would need to spend constantly on research and development to stay ahead of the rapidly improving technology. Inventory would become obsolete extremely quickly Quickly, and that resulted in extremely volatile average selling prices that often dropped below manufacturing costs. Oh yeah, and that's the other thing. Manufacturing these chips is extremely capital intensive because believe it or not, being able to place billions, yes, billions of transistors on a fingernail sized chip requires very, very sophisticated machinery that also is being innovated and upgraded constantly. Micron, for example, currently has $78 billion of property, plant and equipment on their books before depreciation, and in the last 12 months alone, they spent $10.5 billion on equipment and facilities. This incredibly difficult operating environment is best shown by comparing Micron's revenue to their cost of goods sold. Costs directly associated with the sale of memory chips stay fairly stable, while revenues fluctuate wildly due to shifts in consumer demand and average selling price. And revenue isn't the only thing that fluctuates. Take a look at Micron's stock chart for the past four decades. Some of this can be explained by the dot-com bubble, but most of the volatility reflects the huge amount of uncertainty that comes with investment in this kind of business. So I ask again, what do value investors see in this business and in this industry? And Monish, in an interview, actually explained it pretty well. For the longest time, the memory business for decades was a terrible business. And it was all of that going on, Moore's Law and, you know, prices declining, till we hit a point where we were left with three players. And we got left with, I think, three rational players. Everyone saw that there were three players, but they had so much history and pain from the decades in the memory business that they refused to believe that anything was going to be different. And my thesis about three, four years ago was, it's completely different. What Monish is talking about here is the DRAM market specifically. About 75% of Micron's revenues come from the sale of DRAM products such as DDR4 RAM used in PCs and servers or LP DDR4 RAM used in smartphones. The DRAM market over time has become more and more consolidated to the point where today there's just three players left, Samsung, Hynix, and Micron. And Moore's Law, which has explained the exponential improvement and cost reduction of chip making, started to slow down in 2013. And this shouldn't really be any surprise because the number of transistors was doubling every two years, and that was doubling for many, many decades. Pretty quickly, you're talking about billions of transistors placed very closely together. Today, a fingernail-sized chip has about 20 billion transistors on it, and experts believe by around 2020, the physical limits of how many transistors can be placed on a chip will be reached. That is to say that transistors have gotten so small that there are literally not enough atoms, individual atoms, between transistors, or at least we're approaching that point. The smallest transistors today are about 7 to 10 nanometers long. By comparison, a single strand of your DNA is about 2.5 nanometers, and a single silicone atom is about 0.2 nanometers. It's believed that theoretically Theoretically, transistors could get about as small as one nanometer, but at that point, you're literally talking about a transistor that's made up of like five to 10 atoms. So we're talking about the absolute upper limit of this technology. That's crazy. There's no way that's right, right? How are they making them so small? How are they making them so small? And if science is boring for you, let me just give you the economic bottom line. With Moore's law slowing down and eventually ending, even though innovation in this space, of course, will continue to happen in other ways, the biggest driver of innovation and exponential driver of innovation will be slowing down and ending over the next few years. And that means that innovation in the space generally should be slowing down. And that's in combination with the cost of production stabilizing or increasing, certainly not going through 
through a, a halving in the production cost every two years like it was with Moore's Law. And essentially what you get is the slowing innovation will mean inventory lasts longer should stable average selling prices or stabilize average selling prices, at least to some extent. And while rising costs in a very, very competitive market would of course be a very, very bad thing, in an oligopoly where there's only three major players, it can actually mean that it keeps out smaller players from entering the market, acts as a significant barrier to entry. And as long as the three players act rationally in terms of their pricing, it can turn out very, very well for all three of them. Rational pricing is something you'll probably hear a lot about if you're looking into the semiconductor space. It's essentially uh, the idea that uh, when there's limited competition, it's in the best interest of the, the few remaining players to not lower their prices to try and gain market share. It's in their best interest to keep prices high so that they can all benefit from that additional margin. Think of it this way. As innovation slows, these businesses will essentially be selling a commodity. So they'll all have very, very similar products at similar levels of innovation. And the result of that is it could be tempting for one of those businesses to lower their prices and try and compete on price. But if they do that, then no one will make any money in the long run. Everyone will just lower their prices. Whereas if there's only three Three players and none of them lower their prices, which is easier if there's a limited number of players in the space. If there's 12 players, then it's very likely someone's going to lower prices and start a kind of cascade. But if it's an oligopoly or a duopoly, then it's easier for these businesses to uh, not really work together. That's illegal. They wouldn't do that, of course, but uh, to keep their prices high in order to achieve that extra margin. And then the other side of the argument is the demand side where the industry may be going through a process of changing from being cyclical to being a secular demand industry. So the thing is that if you look at a Amazon data center and if it costs them, you know, 200 million or 100 million to put that up, about 30% of that is going to the memory guys. Wow. So, so it's a tax on all the streaming, all the e-commerce, all the shopping, on everything, 30% tax. Particularly as cloud computing and electrical automotive industries grow, there will be a secular increase in demand for memory. And some have argued that this could result in less violent market cycles. And then on top of all of that, of course, investing in stock analysis isn't just about finding a good industry and then investing into that industry. Uh, you need to assess the individual company's competitive advantages, the management team, and ultimately also assess the valuation. How much are we paying for this business? When most of these investors were buying Micron, they were buying it at about six to eight times uh, average five-year earnings. Today, the stock is at about 10 to 11 times aver five-year average earnings. So essentially, from this video, you can kind of compile, you know, the industry continuing to grow, earnings stabilizing, Micron maintaining its competitive position in a uh, market that has very little competition now compared to when it did in the past. I can generally see the full picture. I can see it, but for me, it still probably sits, or definitely I should say, fits in the too hard basket. And maybe I'll try and move it out of that basket over time because it actually is an inter industry that I've found very, very interesting. It's not an area I've looked at before, but over the past week or so, I've dived into it and I'm finding it really fun to learn about. So maybe at some point in the future, I will feel confident enough to look into actually investing in this space but for now, I'm a happy outside observer. This video is sponsored by ShareSite, a comprehensive portfolio tracking tool that automatically tracks the performance of your investments so you can say goodbye to Excel spreadsheets forever. Unlike data provided by most brokers, ShareSite considers the impact of capital gains, dividends, brokerage fees, and currency fluctuations when calculating returns, which gives you a complete picture of your portfolio's performance. ShareSite tracks shares and ETFs across 40 different stock exchanges, 100 currencies, commodities, and even cryptocurrencies and unlisted investments such as private equity. Plus, ShareSite makes tax time a breeze by giving you a simple but comprehensive view of your capital gains and dividend income impact. Use my referral link in the description below or head directly to sharesite.com forward slash Hamish Hodder to try ShareSite for free or receive four months of a yearly subscription.